Hi, I'm Robin Ginn, Executive Director of the OpenJS Foundation, here for another cool story about OpenJS and action. I'm delighted to have Robin Glenn here from YNAP, which is like for me, one of my favorite brands and retailers. So uh, super cool to have Robin here to talk more with us. So Robin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, first, thanks for having me on. It's really exciting. And it's always exciting to see a fan of our website. Um, <laughs> I've been there a while. So, you know, we were quite small and uh, maybe a bit niche. And so when everyone, when anyone says that they've uh, heard of us, it's super exciting for me. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I changed clothes three times. Like, what do I wear? It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I'm a principal developer at YNAP. Um, I'm also a member of the Chrome Advisory Board. I work within a team called the Luxury Division. Um, and we look after Mr. Porter and Netta Porter. Um, yeah, I, I've been there for 10 years, which is, you know, an ice age in, in technology. But uh, I started uh, my career as a designer and a Flash developer. Um, and then I moved to Netta Porter. I've worked in different departments, different teams, wherever my curiosity takes me, I just end up going. Um, that ranges from web standards, uh, performance engineering, test automation, observability, scalability, CICD. And the last six months I've been working in SRE um, and mainly with Kubernetes. So in fact, just before this call, I was uh, running a workshop with um, Weaveworks uh, around Kubernetes. Very cool. Um, so I know technology is pretty important to net porte Can you explain why a big retailer and uh, why that is so important to the company and, the t and your team? Yes, yeah, so I mean, uh, YNAP as a whole, it, it is technology. So um, interestingly enough, it was our 20th anniversary of Ux and Netaporte this year. So if you think about the landscape, you know, in 2000, people were just getting comfortable buying books online. We just had the dot-com burst, uh, you know, uh, Boo, who had blown like 130 million in six months. Um, and we were trying to convince people to spend thousands and thousands on dresses. So technology was about making them feel safe, secure, but, but also exciting. And now 20 years on, you know, people are much more demanding with what they want. So we have to up our game to offer more to them, to, to retain them. So, you know, technology is the, is the backbone of the entire brand. That's cool. I read a blog series that you did over the course of a couple of years, and it talked about sort of this defining moment when you decided to shift your architecture. Do you want to just... You know, sure. Uh, so yeah, you know, like talking to you and, and me being like, oh, I'm excited that you, you know the brand, you know. Um, when I when the company was young, it was kind of niche, underground. Uh, I mean, underground's a bit of a weird <laughs> way, but it, but it wasn't like, no, you know, if you knew, you knew. But uh, it maybe it wasn't that mainstream because um, the, you know, the, the entry to barrier with expensive luxury clothing is quite high. Mm -hmm. So we were quite niche. So what we started getting famous for is sales. And when we'd do our clearance, um, so what would happen is a sale would come around and we, we couldn't hold the traffic, right? Mm -hmm. So th there was the decision of, do we, you know, we were still on physical tin back then. Do, do we get this extra hardware? And then we have this point of redundancy for the rest of the year. Right. Or do we look at something else? So we looked at, you know, cloud offerings. Um, and we just made one small, simple microservice of the sale listing page, put it on AWS to horizontally scale, just to distribute some of that load. Mm -hmm. um, and then we managed to keep the site up, uh, which was obviously really exciting. But also we'd seen this kind of change in our mindset, you know, with microservices of teams having autonomy to release faster. Uh, we had changed the way we're doing automation testing. And all of these things just freed us up a bit. And that started us on this um, microservice architecture uh, and, and, and that's taken us to where we are today. Great. Um, so talk about a little bit where you are today in that sort of, you've been there 10 years. How are you sort of um, defining your architecture? What, uh, you know, what solutions are you building? Um, sure. and we'll talk a little bit more about some of those challenges. So we, um, as I was saying, so the sale app was successful then different teams started getting autonomy and they were like, okay, we're going to cut up the, uh, the website into, into different domains. So like, okay, uh, shopping parts or listing parts and, you know, separating things out. And we followed um, in that journey. We'd had separate domain specific teams to do different jobs. 
and they would have complete autonomy of their applications and get deployed. So we, we had a first pass of that, um, and that was pretty successful. Uh, we learned a lot. There was also problems. Um, and then we got an opportunity to, to start again from scratch. So they wanted to change the way that our logistics worked, new factory, uh, new distribution centers, new robotics. Uh, so that included having like new API structure. So we took the opportunity as a front end team to say, all right, let's, let's take what we learned in the first few attempts and, and, and do it again. So we did that for Mr. Porto and that went live globally. So we did it in segments of countries that went global this year. Um, the outnet, who I don't work exactly in side, but they are also using that infrastructure and architecture and code that we built. So it's all brand agnostic. So they're already on it. And now we're just in the process of migrating Netaporte onto it as well. So then we'll have three, you know, uh, large brands with over, I think it's half a billion page views a month, all using this new infrastructure. Um, so at the moment, yeah, we're, we are implementing Netaporte onto that. Um, but we've got some technical things that we that we really want to look at going forward as well, um, which mainly wraps around Google's push towards the things called core web vitals. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, you know, so what were some of the factors that sort of drove your decisions on the technologies that you chose when you, you know, moved to the new, you know, I know you moved from microservices and now you're you're ev evolving that further. So, so what what we had. Um, previously in the past, which is, you know, I think it's quite common and, and, and it works for many businesses, but it, we'd hit this breaking point. So we had uh, a large Java Spring MVC application, uh, you know, what some people might call a monolith. And that was separated into like two teams. There was like the backend team writing the Java. And then there was the front end team who were just writing JavaScript client side and CSS HTML. Um, and when we made these microservices, we adopted Node.js really because we wanted this kind of uh, fast iteration. So we had a bunch of client-side JavaScript developers who were learning more server-side JavaScript. Um, and yeah, that's, so that was, uh, you know, really successful for us. And we wanted to break that apart and follow. What we wanted more than anything is rapidness. So we wanted people to not do context switching. So if you were doing a front-end feature, you could also do it on the server. So the main thing, for us was around context switching and we had a huge pool of resource of JavaScript devs. Yeah. So we wanted to, to, to keep that. And, and we've looked at other projects um, in the blog post you referenced, we built a POC in Go and we also built one in, in Node.js. And although uh, we got them similar and comparable throughput, the, the ultimate deciding factor was we didn't have that many Go developers, but we had a huge pool of, of, of JavaScript developers. So we wanted to keep that, that lack of context switching. So when you work in our ecosystem, we, we use things like Jest for our, our unit tests. We use Cypress and Puppeteer for our functional tests. Our server's written in Node.js. We use JavaScript frameworks. Um, and we have things like Autocannon, which is a, a benchmarking low testing written in JavaScript. We use Node Clinic, which is a JavaScript tool for Node. So we have like this closed ecosystem where, uh, not closed, but we have this like, if you need to switch between projects, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, and that's not to say that we haven't got other things. We have plenty of things written in Go um, and we've got some things in .NET um, uh, and C Sharp, sorry. And, but the idea was it was more important for us to be fast and iterating and if there was maybe a, a throughput loss, the, the expenditure in horizontally expanding the service to take that load was the cost is lower than the engineering cost of hiring people in these different languages. So we get switching is what we wanted to avoid. Um, we, we still evaluate technologies uh, to see, you know, what, uh, what works, but that's a big factor for us was iterating fast. Oh, great. And it sounds like your team was pretty adaptable and moving to those. Yeah. Do you know, like we, as a small group of front end devs worked with some SRE and infrastructure and we got Kubernetes deployed running and we're really happy with it, but we got these opportunity to give front end devs the opportunity to learn how to do this infrastructure work. So, you know, we have a pool of talent. People want to move around this. Uh, 
yeah, we, we try and encourage that to just move around uh, and see what you can adopt and what you're interested in. Yeah, that's very cool and very rewarding for them. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your decision to use Fastify and uh, your, you know, and how that impacts your web performance. So the, this is, uh, was for a specific project, which um, is called Loca. There's a, a blog on our medium called um, Solving a Problem Like Routing. It's a series um, where we talk about the adoption of Fastify. And the main thing for us was, so we have a bunch of presentation servers uh, in Node.js and most of them use Express and that, that worked well for us. There's, uh, there's a few now that are using Next.js and we've been working with uh, Vercel and Google about how to tune that. Yeah. Um, we're POC in with uh, something called Sapper, which is a Svelte equivalent of Next.js. But th this application, Loka, is, is like a proxy of how to orchestrate our microservices. So if a certain route comes in, it looks like this pattern, you need to call this microservice. And then it did a bunch of like business logic as well. So the, the main point was, and my fear when, when I started looking at it was, this is a single point of failure. It's a bottleneck that all the requests have to come through to, to decide what, what HTML a customer gets back. So performance was, was absolutely key. Mm -hmm. So we built a POC in, uh, go and it had like super high throughput and concurrency. We built one in uh, just no JS. It was lower. Um, we built one in Express and it was still lower than we were happier with. So then we tried out Fastify and you know we started using multiple cores and we felt like we could. We can't compete with uh, with Go, but we could we could get to a level of parity that we were happy with. So. Um, yeah, performance was, was key. I've also worked with Matteo from Neoform multiple times and, you know, he's a, he's a performance genius and they're so obsessed with performance. Yeah. We knew that that was the kind of right framework for us because we needed that, that enthusiasm to keep it going. Um, um, yeah, those and, you know, working relationship with Matteo and Neoform, they've come into our company a few times and done some training. We knew we were onto a winner as soon as we started looking through that. That's great. And it's, uh, it is good to see that uh, project grow and, and get better every day. And probably with your implementation, we're all, everybody's learning as they go as well. Yeah. It's, we were, you know, we were adopters of like, it uses the log of Pino, which is in there. We were already using that in all our applications anyway. Um, do you know, it, it's, it's a great project. We don't have a huge need to move some of the other applications because they don't have that level of throughput requirement. Um, so Express works, you know, fine for them. But with this, the amount of throughput that we wanted this to do, it, it was super important, uh, important for us. And as it been a, a proxy, it's basically network bound. Uh, so that's where like all the latency is, is calling these services. But when we were uh, doing our performance tests, uh, checking for bottlenecks, you know, it, it, the compute time of a request when you take out the network is like, under two milliseconds usually. So it's super fast churning it through. So yeah, we, we, we are really happy. That's great. Great to see those results. Cool. Very cool. Um, sounds like you're working with a few other uh, OpenJS Foundation projects, probably AMP maybe. Did I hear that? Uh, so part of my um, role on the Chrome Advisory Board is that uh, I, I've been involved with AMP and some of the other things since since the get-go and also I was traveling with some other um, conferences we we haven't got a huge adoption of of AMP yet we've looked at it in, in different senses I think we there's some web open standards questions that we have as a development team around around AMP um, I but I know that the editorial parts of the company uh, are really interested in it um, but yeah, we, we're not a huge adopter yet, but we, we have looked at it. Oh, good. And I know they're building out an advisory team as well. So lots of uh, opportunities to give input there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and definitely part of um, working with different Google working groups. We, we have daily dialogue with the, the Google team and their DevRel team. Um, so I, I think there's been a couple of POCs. It's just it hasn't been massively prioritized for us yet. Great. Um, so I know that you, like I said, you're, you've been there 10 years. And so you, kind of, you have that luxury of having that sort of big picture. I mean, it's hard to say you have a big picture, but you probably do given the history. So what's sort of next on, you know, for your engineering roadmap? What's your... So, 
Um, I think like the big thing for us is uh, performance, as you know, most people say. I think uh, performance has traditionally been quite a, a hard sell. I don't think that the tool chain was good enough to begin with. Like um, collecting performance data was a bit hit and miss. The browsers weren't offering enough. Um, but yeah, the, now the browsers have uh, good implementations of performance metrics. You can you can quite easily start to correlate. Okay, uh, you can bucket people off for good performance, bad performance, or whatever, and then look at you know correlate on your KPIs for business conversion, bounce rate, these kind of things. So that's that's a huge thing for us, um, as as I'm sure it is for everyone. But the a, a really interesting thing is if you know the core web vitals, which are first input delay, largest contentful paint cumulative layout shift. So those now are measuring not just performance, but good customer experience. So is the website nice to use? Um, and if you look at Google's search tools now, they are starting to add the core web vitals. Does your website have core web vitals um, based off your user's crux report? So it doesn't take a genius to start thinking, well, Google are now gonna start either badging good UX or they're going to start ranking based on good user experience. So it's not just a case anymore of, okay, these can affect your, your business KPIs. These could affect your business rankings or these could affect your natural search. So for us, um, that, that is a big, that's a big question. And uh, many people have been down the journey already, but you know, stopping to use rest um, as your API endpoints, you know, maybe building something a bit more flexible. That's something that we're looking at. Another big thing that we're looking at is uh, zero runtime frameworks. Um, I think it's an industry problem of JavaScript bloat in the browser. Like we've just shipped more and more JavaScript. And in the luxury department, we, we don't have the problem that other companies do so much because our, bar our, our barrier of entry is already high, right? We sell watches that are 200,000 pounds. So the adoption rate of uh, new phones is high. So we have the luxury of having high compute phones, uh, good memory. And generally, I think it's 95% of our traffic is, is 4G. So we're lucky, but we still want to take our website on a bit of a, you know, so cut some JavaScript bloat. So we're looking at different um, zero runtime frameworks like Svelte to, to, to see in the future what, what that might look like. Um, at the moment, you know, it's just POCs. We're still migrating. Um, and we've just got some ideas, but we're also working on Next.js with the Vercel team and with Google uh, to help, you know, improve performance there. But that, that I think for the next year is, is probably what we will look at, um, as well as more experimentation. Um, we've been writing some interesting stuff in Kubernetes to, to roll out um, applications at different experiments. Um, so you server side rendered A-B testing through Kubernetes. That's quite interesting. Uh, yeah, those are the big things I think for us, but a focus on web vitals, it, I think is going to be big for everyone in the industry um, for the next year, I think. Got it. Okay. And I have one question I always uh, love to ask devs. So when you go to work, what's a good day at work for you? Um, not back to back meetings. That's the dream. If you get a, if you get a day without meetings, that's uh you know, that's a highlight. Um, I like to, I bounce off people's energy. So I really like to see what other people are doing uh, and just geek out, you know, talk about it. Yeah. But I mean, people in work get a bit distressed by this, by me. But what I really like, because uh, I've been working in SRE in like the last six months, mm -hmm. is I, I like when things go wrong, do you know? Uh, mm -hmm. When things break, it's like the closest I feel like I am to a detective. Like you're looking for clues, trying to find the smoking gun of what, what caused the issue. So I, I think that like, that's where like the adrenaline and the excitement, if something goes wrong, I, I really enjoy that. I, not too often, you know, I want the customers to have a good time, but when something goes wrong, it's quite exciting. That's very cool. Inspector Robin, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I like. Well, we're just delighted to have you part of our community and again, I'm super excited to hear about all the cool things that you're building at net porte and YNAP and all those cool brands that you have. So uh, really thanks for joining us and we hope that you uh, pop back in and share um, everything that you know and are learning along the way.
Of course, and absolute pleasure uh, to be asked. It was really nice to be here and chat to you guys.